gonna waste the bread. Let me show you the perfect recipe. Soak your dry old bread in water. Add a blessing to be in the house of the Lord once again. Amen. It is Sunday, January 17th, 2021, and we have, as I always say, another great lesson before us today. The lesson is entitled, Called to Heal. The Bible background is Mark 2, 1 through 12. The printed text is Mark 2, 1 through 12. And the devotional reading is Psalms 103, 1 through 14. Our aim for change says, by the end of this lesson, we will study Mark's account of Jesus healing the man who was paralyzed, appreciate how one's physical, emotional, social, and spiritual needs are intertwined, and pray for God's healing grace to touch us at our particular point of need. You know, it's so funny, y'all. Y'all remember, Pastor just preached this a couple of Sundays ago. Uh-huh. And I, I did the same thing. I said, well, wait a minute. And I said, uh, oh, Pastor done preached it. Now I'm going to teach it. Amen. So we, it, it must be something to this particular lesson for us to have already had it preached to us a couple of weeks ago. And now we're getting ready to learn a little bit more and discuss this same thing. As we go through this, Aim for Change said we're going to study, appreciate, and pray. So when you study, that means you're going to just ponder on some things. You're going to look at it, and you're going to look at it, and you're going to look at it. 
and you're going to let it marinate on you because of the fact, I remember when growing up, our grandmama used to tell us to recite the 23rd Psalm and to put whatever we're trying to study under our pillow. And that was a way of extra study and focus and concentration. And then appreciate, we know what appreciate means. A lot of times we, talk, we, we know of people that don't feel appreciated. And if you, you think about it, a lot of, we have pastor appreciation because we know with all that he does, we want to let him know that your work is not going unnoticed. We want you to know that we appreciate what you've done. And then that last one, we're going to pray, which we should be praying without ceasing. It should be a constant thing. We need to be praying for ourselves, others, and also doing, as they call that, corporate prayer as well. Anybody want to say anything on the aim for change before we go further into this Sunday school lesson? All right, the in focus. Brenda listened to the small group's prayer request. They were going to pray for Lee's cousin who had cancer, Jordan's knee replacement surgery, and Georgie's nephew who had an opioid addiction. Brenda thought hard, but her family was blessed with good health at the moment. She had just video chatted with her parents a couple of days ago, and everyone was happy and healthy. Especially in the face of the other serious prayer requests, she felt embarrassed to ask about what was really weighing on her heart. She often suffered from mild seasonal affective disorder. She had felt in settling in over her once Christmas vacation back home in Mississippi was over and she had come back to Virginia where she worked. When it was her turn, Brenda took a deep breath and shared, I feel silly asking this, but could you guys pray for my mental health? Brenda met the small group sympathetic gazes. I usually have seasonal depression and I'm worried this year will be worse than usual since this is my first winter here away from my family. No need to feel silly at all, Brenda. Thanks for letting us know how to help you, the small group leader Jordan said. I've had some bouts with depression myself and I'm happy to talk with you about it if you want. God cares about our wholeness in all aspects of our beings, bodily, mentally, and spiritually. How can we work as a church to make sure we minister to the whole person? The whole person. Because the one thing about it, we know that we work together. It's like, you know, when in the scriptures when it talks about, the eye can't say he no better than the foot. It's one body working together. And with that being the case, if your mind ain't right, your body ain't right, your spirit ain't right. If your body ain't right, your mind ain't right, your spirit ain't right. It all work together. It's just like when, you know, your feet may hurt and it causes your whole body to hurt and to be out of line because something's wrong. Same here when we're talking about the aspect of Body, mind, and spirit. It's all together. Anybody want to say anything on this in focus? How can we work as a church to make sure we minister to the whole person? How can we do that? Only thing I can say is some people don't like to ask for help when they're going through situations. Mm -hmm. um, they want to hold it in. A lot of times, you have to give them a chance to to be able to to uh, respond to someone else about it. And then they sometimes you have people that tell people things about what's going on mm -hmm. with them, and they use it to their advantage. Mm -hmm. You understand what mm -hmm. I'm saying? So you have to be careful and mindful mm -hmm. of what you say about what you're going on personally, mm -hmm. because everybody just can't trust with your personal. Issues. You know what, Andrew? You have said so much. Because I'm gonna tell you, when you said some people don't like to ask for help. Mm -hmm. And um, I can relate to that because of the fact that, you know, there are times when I feel as though I need to be helping others. I don't need to be asking somebody to help me. As you go through life, you get to a place, especially with going through certain things, where you get to where you can ask for help. But like you said, you watch who you ask for help because people just want to know your business. They ain't want to help you. 
They just want to have something to go and talk about to somebody else. And that's the thing that we've got to be mindful of when we are trying to be helpful, if you will. Deke, you want to say something? I do. Uh, listen, when we stu study, we learn. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, as, as far as this in focus, when we are speaking about prayer uh, uh, pertaining to this aim of change and appreciation, when you, when you go through something in life, you never know who has gone through that ahead mm -hmm. of you. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. when you learn that someone else has went through the same thing that you've been mm -hmm. through, you learn to appreciate mm -hmm. it more. Mm -hmm. Then come that prayer. Listen, God wants us to let him know what it is. If you don't ask from the heart and mean it, he's not going to answer. Mm. So come on out with whatever it is. It, we should never be ashamed of what we go through as human beings because God said we're going to have trials and tribulations. Mm -hmm. So listen, a lot of times, I had seizures before. Listen, I had to, uh, told somebody about it, and they had went through the same thing. So hey, they turned, uh, turned me on with some information mm -hmm. to how to deal with it. And I appreciated mm -hmm. it more. Mm -hmm. and so listen, don't ever be ashamed to say what's going on with you. And, and there's always somebody who might be able to pray a little bit harder than you. Mm. And that prayer get through. Amen. Amen. Anybody else want to say anything on the aim for change or the in focus before we go further into this Sunday school lesson? All right. <laughs> Keep in mind, whether is it it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, arise and take up thy bed and walk. Matthew, excuse me, Mark 2, 9, that's the King James Version. New Living Translation says it in this way. Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or stand up, pick up your mat and walk? Mark 2, 9. As we go further into this Sunday school lesson, as we've already said, we've already had this, this preached to us. Now we're going to have it taught and discussed this morning. And it's going to be interesting to see what else comes out as we discuss this Sunday school lesson further. <clears throat> Who will do our reading? Thank you, Deke. Mark 2, verses 1 through 12. And again, he entered into Capernaum after, after some days, and it was noise that the house was full, back up, and it was noise that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them, no, not so much as the, as the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they came unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they, not come, and when they could not come not unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was, and when they had broken it, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sons be forgiven thee. But there was certain of the of scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether it is easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise, and take up thy bed, and walk. But, but that ye may know the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they, all, that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it in on this fashion. Amen. Thank you, Deke. The one thing I was thinking when Deke was reading, reading these uh, scriptures, one word kept coming to mind as he kept reading. Determination. And there was determination and wrapped in faith in this. 
All right, let's go on a little bit further. The people, places, and time. Palsy. This disability is due to the loss of motor function of muscles or certain nerves. It refers to all forms of paralysis. The word palsy translates to the Greek word palaticus, from which we derive the English word paralytic or paralysis. The man in this week's scripture is paralyzed, hence he is unable to walk by himself to meet Jesus. Matthew records the Capernaum centurion asking Jesus to heal his servant of paralysis, which caused him terrible suffering. The apostles also healed those who suffered from this condition. Now, as we go into this lesson, we talk about palsy. It's already given us the, the, uh, the definition and explanation as to what palsy is and the fact that it is a paralysis. You can't move a certain part of your body. And the beautiful thing about God and, and, and his, his healing is the fact that when he heals, you don't have to go through rehabilitation. You don't have to go through physical therapy. When he say, rise, take up your bed and walk, it don't mean go make your physical therapy appointment so that we can start getting the, the muscles back moving. It means get up and go. And that's a beautiful thing, especially when you know, and you, you, you've known of people that have had some type of injury where they had to go through some type of therapy in order to get the muscle tone back, to get the movement back. But this person, all he had to do was have that faith. There you go, that faith in Jesus. Amen. Anybody want to say anything on the palsy in the people, places, and time before I go a little bit further? on my page and I had already said you know thank y'all but I'm, I'm I'm covered in the blood <laughs> so as I went to have my procedure done surely as I sit here right now I can say they said I don't want to see you anymore for five years Amen. that's how I know I have that much determination Amen. and know God is, can heal me in anything I do and want to do Amen. God got me yes I'm, he does I, just, I love that Amen. <laughs> Amen. alright scribes Often called lawyers, doctors, or teachers of the law, they were not considered a Jewish sect or a party, nor were they priests. The title scribe referred to their capacity as transcribers of the Hebrew Bible. They could copy the entire Old Testament by hand onto new scro scrolls when a new copy was needed. This careful, precise copying of the entire law, prophets, and writings gave them great knowledge of the scriptures. Mark presents the scribes as often in the company of Pharisees and of the chief priests and coming from Jerusalem. The question says, have you had special training or a profession that gave you expertise in a subject? How do you and others value that skill? Now, that could be associated with any type of training that you receive. Because now that you've been trained in it, you have special training. You have somewhat, if you will, of an expertise in that particular skill or subject. It's just like when you think about different opportunities in the church. I'll use my pastor as an example. Pastor is talented with playing the piano. Uh, so therefore, if we are in need of a, a song, pastor can go over to the piano and play. Now, one of us could go over to the piano, but it won't be music that you'll hear. It'll be banging because that is not, if you will, our field of expertise. But the one thing that it shows is that we all got an expertise in something. Somebody else's may be that they are a good cook. So they may be a part of the kitchen ministry to be in the kitchen. But if you don't know how to boil water, the kitchen ministry may not be, if you will, your expertise. So you, you, when you talk about having that training and, and, and that knowledge of doing something specific, here we go talking about special training or a profession that gives you expertise in the subject. How do you and others value that skill? When you say value that skill, in valuing that skill, that means that you are going to use it. 
because there is no need in having a skill that you pretty much put on the shelf and don't use it. It makes me think about in Indian Creek when we, when we had Sunday school convention, one of the, the programs is geared towards your talent. It says use your talent for the master. So therefore you may have special gifts that can be used for service. Anybody want to say anything right there under scribe when we talk about service and talents and professions and expertise? Well, all right then. Background. The news of Jesus, the worker of miracles, spread throughout Capernaum. This was an exciting time. The community had never experienced a healer and teacher like Jesus. No wonder Mark 1, 32 through 33 speaks of the townspeople bringing all the sick and demon-possessed to Jesus. And in Jesus' great compassion, he healed every one of them, but he too needed a time of restful healing. So the next morning, he departed to be alone with the Father. The scriptures do not tell the length of Jesus' solitude, but his time was shortened by the disciples' appearance. Jesus did not appear to be irritated by the disciples' presence, but informed them he must preach in other places. Let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also, for therefore came I forth. Of a certainty, there were more people in need of healing in Capernaum, but Jesus knew his mission was to spread the gospel to everyone, so he traveled to other towns. The question says, do you make time to recharge with periods of solitude? Do you make time to recharge? You got to. It's just like we, when we talk about our pastor and say, Pastor, you getting your rest? You getting you some downtime? Pastor, turn off your phone. Give yourself that little time because, you know, we know that you, your job is not the most easiest job. And so you need that regroup time. And, you know, you can think about that with any of our jobs. We need that regroup time because I'm just tickled pink that this is my first time with the company I work for of us getting MLK Day off. And I'm just tickled pink. It's like, what? Yeah, so it's like I'm, I'm going I'm to sit back and I'm going to enjoy, if you will, the solitude of being able to take that break from work because we all need that because if you don't, you can get burnt out because you don't have that time to regroup. And when we're talking about Jesus, Jesus was going from town to town, preaching and teaching and healing. And the one thing is that I, and in this, we know that there were places that wanted Jesus to stay longer and, and so that they can continue to receive his teaching as well as experience the healing. But as Jesus told his disciples, okay, we've been in Capernaum, we still got some other places that we need to go. We got places to go, people to see, people to heal, people to minister to, sins to be forgiven. He's got a lot to do. He's on a, if you will, he got a schedule. He's on a time frame because he got a lot to do because he know where he's headed. He was but on a mission. He was on a mission. Amen. Amen, D. That's the third thing is that there's often scriptures in the Bible line. We should go as a... Uh, as we go, wherever we go, mm -hmm. as Christians, mm -hmm. we should be able to tell somebody about Christ everywhere that we go. Amen. You know, and it's, it's, it's a, it, that's amazing for that to be taught because he had a mission here and there and everywhere. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, he said, be like me. Spread that gospel Amen. everywhere. Amen. 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 Anybody else want to say anything on that background before, before we go further into this? All right. Uh, at a glance, Jesus preaches. Jesus pardons. Jesus heals. Jesus preaches. When Jesus entered Capernaum, he preached the word, meaning the gospel of God's kingdom. Mark's description of the enthusiastic crowd that gathered suggests that it filled the house, jammed the doorway, and spilled out into the street. What a tribute to the ministry of Jesus. Four men carrying one sick of the palsy joined the crowd, but were unable to access Jesus through the doorway. Therefore, to get within touching distance of Jesus, they carried the paralytic up the outside stairway to the roof of the house. The oriental house structure in those days were one or two stories, built in a rectangle or square. They had one door that opened into an open space called the porch. Often the porch contained a stairway that led to the roof. 
So these friends saw the roof as a means to reach Jesus. They tore the roof open and lowered the paralytic on his bed down through the opening to where Jesus stood preaching. What a scene. The question says, share about a time you had worked hard to help a friend hear the word of God. You just, exactly. Amen. And the one thing that you, you see, the, now notice he said, friend. There was some, yes, they were the real good friends. Can you imagine those friends hearing Jesus going to be preaching and healing and teaching over at Peter's house? And so we need to get you over there so that we can get you healed. So we're going to carry you over there so that Jesus can heal you. Can you imagine as they're walking with their friend, carrying their friend, to where Jesus is preaching and teaching and healing, and they see the crowd and look and go, okay, we can't go through the front door. It's jam-packed. Can't go through the window. You, and there's no space. It's standing room only, if you will. We're going to get you in there. Exactly. Oh, We're we going to get you in there. Can you imagine them surveying and thinking, the roof. We're going we gonna to go up these steps, go through the porch, and we're going to make a hole in the roof, and we're going to lower you down to Jesus so that you can get your healing. Can y'all imagine? The, okay. Tear up a roof. Put a hole in them people's roof. But the thing about it is they, if they, they knew how to put a hole in it, they knew how to fix it back. You know, and, and the thing about it, y'all think about that. Can y'all imagine being so determined, so determined to get your friend in to receive a healing that you're not going to let what you see de exactly, not going to stop you, not going to deter you, not going to discourage you. We're going to get you in there. Mm -hmm. As he was the, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. person on that bed. Mm -hmm. See, they had to believe too. That's the great thing, knowing that, that, that I'm, I'm going to take you to Jesus. That you faith. Know That's four mm -hmm. plus him. Mm -hmm. That's five. Mm -hmm. He said only it takes two in the midst of two on there. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Amen. <laughs> Amen. For Jesus, that he would be healed, and mm -hmm. they weren't going to let nothing stop them from getting him to Jesus. Ain't going to let nothing stop. And, and, and listen, church, this is a, a prime example of doing something for someone and expecting nothing, nothing in, in return. return. Mm -hmm. Ain't that something? Ain't that something? But you know what, Deacon, what you're saying that, doing something and expecting nothing in return also shows your loyalty, your faithfulness, your the 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 strength in your friendship. All of that is exemplified. Those are some, if you will, ride or die, right there, right there. That's some true friends, right there. You know, because you know those other friends, they'll be there for a minute, then the next thing you know. They gone, and they are uh, sending your call to voicemail. But here, these friends are. That's, that says a lot. It is. It is. Beautiful. Anybody just want to say anything right there? All right. Jesus pardons. Jesus knows this extraordinary action was based on extraordinary faith. He pardons the crippled man's sin. The teachers of the law said nothing but were outraged as they pondered Jesus forgiving the sins of another. Based on Old Testament laws, the scribes knew only God had the authority to forgive sins. In their view, Jesus had committed blasphemy, a serious charge that was punishable by death. Even though the scribes do not voice their concerns aloud, Jesus knows their thoughts which serves as further proof that he is the all-knowing, all-powerful God. Jesus declares his authority as one who is able not only to heal, but also 
to forgive sin. Jesus' words convey to the scribes that forgiving sin are no harder than healing. Since Jesus can heal, as the scribes had seen him do, then he can also forgive sin. Can y'all imagine the look on those scribes' face when they started talking about in their thoughts and over there whispering and what he doing? He can't, he ain't got the authority to talk about forgiving sin. Who does he think he is? Only God can do that. Can you imagine the look of surprise on their face when Jesus said to them that not only can he forgive sin, but he can also heal? Can you imagine when they said only God can do that? Okay, but, but can you imagine because of the fact that Jesus knew their thoughts? They didn't say it out loud, but he knew. Because think about it in the midst of that crowd. And he, all knowing, all powerful, all wise God, heard your thoughts and then going to tell you, he going to answer your question even though you didn't ask it out loud. Okay, you ain't have to say anything, but I know, I know what you're thinking. So let me just answer your question. Uh-huh. D, come on, you raise up in your seat. Come on. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> man, we were just talking about uh, learning different skills at different levels. Mm -hmm. Now, listen, these scribes, they, that was their skill mm -hmm. to, to know uh, about the Hebrew. Mm -hmm. But listen, just like t today, it don't matter what you're skilled at, it's always somebody who's going to know a little bit more than what mm -hmm. you do. Mm -hmm. Jesus is the prime example, mm -hmm. right? Right. Mm -hmm. this, uh, Jesus. Amen. I just want to say that. Amen. Amen. D. Amen. Anybody else want to say anything on Jesus' part of? Amen. Amen. <laughs> All right. Jesus heals. Jesus turns his attention to the paralytic and commands him, "Arise and take up your bed and go thy way into thine house." I'm going to stop right there for a minute because in the New Living Translation, I like how he put this in New Living Translation because it tickled me. He said, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. <laughs> just, and and it's like, all right, let, let him know. Just pick it up and go. Can y'all imagine the look on, on the people's face when he said, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home? And he, after being in that, on that mat, the, can you imagine how big people's eyes got that knew that this man has, had been all this time? And with those words spoken by Jesus to him, <laughs> he stood up, picked up his mat, and went home. Can you imagine? You know what made me think about y'all? Y'all know how sometimes made me think about the part of the Red Sea when he stood up, picked up that mat, and got ready to walk. Can you see the, the crowd just as he walked through with his mat? And you know, to be that to, to be able to tell that, I, you know, I'm like Pastor, in my spiritual imagination, I could see that man picking up that mat, rolling it up, putting it on his arm, and not walking out but running out because of the fact that I've been down for so long and now I can get up and move around. I'm out. And I'd be running out that door. Feeling good and praising God as I go because, okay, because, because I was lowered down through a hole in the roof because I couldn't walk. But now I'm going to stand up, roll up my mat, and walk out the front door. Look at God. Anybody want to say anything on that little bit before I go just a little bit further? I just had to point that out. The healing verified Jesus' claim to grant forgiveness. Since the healing was real and impossible for any but God, the claim to forgive sin is also real. The paralytic immediately arose, took up his bed, and walked out in full view of the crowd. This amazed everyone, and they praised God. They had never seen anything like this. Can you, you know what, y'all? I got another spiritual imagination. And just looking at that, when he did that, 
Can you imagine the silence that went across that house? Okay, that, that, exactly, that, that, that gasp of, <laughs> and, then, and then just seeing everybody just, okay, amen, amen, because this is something right here that, if you will, you witness this, you don't have nobody telling you, guess what happened, you saw this for yourself. And it just got you just eyes bugged out. Stop. Stop. Okay, mouth hanging open in awe because of what you just witnessed. Anybody else want to say anything right there? Uh, Mark, let's bring out to the uh, things today. I bet you it was a lot of disbelievers in that crowd. They saw what Jesus did, but they didn't believe it. They, they were thinking it was a fake uh, a, a rude or mm -hmm, something mm -hmm. that that old man and Jesus were doing. They were set, yeah, set up. So, you know, it's, it's just the way people are to then and people are today. Mm -hmm. The same way. It, mm -hmm. it, it did nothing change. Mm -hmm. Now, you can see a miracle happen. You know it happened. Mm -hmm. You know it's real. Mm -hmm. But you still got those 2%, mm -hmm. 1% mm -hmm. that say it was a rude. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen, D. Amen. <laughs> Every healing that takes place is cause for rejoicing and praising God. God still heals, but we all know instances where healing don't occur. Sometimes in the face of our illness, our faith demonstrates God's higher purpose in our relationship with him. Our faith, despite the absence of physical healing can it recognize the grace of God's peace and strength amid our weakened state. God's healing may be physical, emotional, or spiritual, even in the absence of healing. Let me just start right there. 